Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll try to give you a taste about the kind of material you'll find in this paper called Abstraction Refinement Guided by a Learned Probabilistic Model. Uh, now that we got the first slide out of the way, let's proceed to the last slide of the talk. So if you look at the paper, you will find out how you can implement a refinement algorithm once and have it work for several static analyses, not just one. And on the way to that goal, we discover several things. Some of them are intermediate steps. Others are more like side effects, but are kind of interesting. So for example, there's a way to quantify how much approximation takes place in one particular part of the implementation of a static analyzer. Um, and um, there's also a way to figure out how to adapt this uh, refinement algorithm to a particular code base and to a particular analysis to make it work better for that kind of analysis or that kind of code base. Now, we will get there, but I will start slowly. So, uh, if you implement a static analysis, you will have performance issues. And you can do two things to solve this. You can sit down and think hard about your problem, your specific analysis, and come up with um, optimizations for that uh, analysis. Another thing you can do is you can reach out for a toolbox of generic techniques, such as abstraction refinement. One way to visualize this idea of abstraction refinement is uh, as follows. Imagine somebody comes to you, uh, gives you a map and says, find the route between these two points. You might be tempted to implement something like Dexter or A star, and if you do so, you will soon find out that humans implement, uh, um, build more roads than these algorithms can handle quickly. Uh, a better approach is to find first a route that uses only main roads, then uh, look at that, and if you see some portion that is particularly sinuous, uh, try to find the shortcut by looking at smaller roads. And then you iterate this process looking at smaller and smaller roads. Now in program analysis, you do something similar. So as an example, you can think of having a code base of a million lines of code. One of these lines is an assertion that says one particular variable is non-null. You want to prove that assertion. And on the first try, you ignore most of those million lines of code. You don't look at almost anything else. And you might still succeed in proving uh, your assertion because, I don't know, maybe just before that there's an assignment that does the trick. So, of course, you might fail. If you failed, you have some idea of what, why you failed and where else in the program you should look at. And then you iterate, looking at more and more of these million lines of code, taking them into consideration. Now, we know that abstraction refinement is useful, but it's not a magic bullet. We know it's useful because it has been applied for many analyses. Uh, if you take any of these implementations and you look at the details, you probably need to squint a little bit to see it as an instance of what I just said, but it doesn't take too much effort. But the other way around is much more difficult. So just suppose you work on some static analysis and somehow before this talk you didn't hear about abstraction refinement. If you just heard what I said now, it's probably difficult to go back to your code and implement it. So in other words, there's a non-trivial amount of work involved in applying this high-level idea. And the work that I'm presenting comes from a different, different mindset where we say, uh, let's try to implement uh, refinement once and for all, static analysis. <clears throat> now, this is kind of impossible. It's uh, way too ambitious. Uh, but we made some significant progress towards that. Um, we don't do it for all static analysis. We'll do it for the static analysis that satisfy some requirements that are fairly weak. The main requirement we have is that the analysis is implemented in a declarative language data log. So the refinement loop we have is the usual one, but there's several things to notice on this picture. The box on the right with the refinement is fixed, by the, but the one on the left with the analysis is not. You can take out this analysis, put in another analysis, and then the same refinement algorithm will, will work. 
Now, um, in general, the reason why an analysis fails is called abstract counterexample. And in our case, because we have the requirement that the analysis is implemented in data log, we have a standard format for representing the counterexample, which is a set of data log instance rules. So, or set of instances of data log rules. So that gives us a standard interface for communicating information from left to right. We also need a standard interface for completing the loop. And for that, we require the analysis to expose a set of knobs, each of them having two positions, cheap and precise. Now, all of this is actually also in a previous paper. Um, and in this particular paper, what do we do is uh, two main things. One is that we propose a different refinement algorithm than we had there. This one is pessimistic and it works better on uh, the experiments we tried. And the other thing is that we add another set of knobs on the refinement itself that let you configure and make this uh, work a little bit better. And we have an automatic way of setting the, of finding the best uh, settings for those as well. Okay. Now, let us look at an example. So, suppose you have this program and you want to do taint analysis on it. Uh, this is a fairly idiosyncratic language, so I'll explain a little bit what these commands are supposed to do. Uh, on line one, you have a smudge3yz command, which um, could propagate dirt from object Y to object Z, depending on the values in this object, uh, on the relation of the values in this object, actually. Um, we know that the other commands in the program do not propagate dirt, so they don't have anything to do with that. And if we know that, then the most conservative analysis we can do is to say, well, we just assume that these match commands always propagate dirt, that means we don't have to look at the values, which means we don't have to look at these uh, other statements that uh, uh, modify the values uh, of the object. So we just ignore what happens there. That's the first iteration. Now, we might be able to show that the object we want to be clean is clean, or we might fail, in which case we need to take into account some of these values, which means we need to take into account some of these uh, intermediate um, statements. And we want to implement this analysis in data log. So what's data log? Data log is a set of rules that are applied until you reach a fixed point. This is a very small example of a data log program that computes the transitive closure of a graph. To run this program, you need to give it uh, its input. That is, you need to say that the domain of the variables is a set of vertices of the graph. And you have to say what are the arcs. And then you run it as follows. You look at the first rule, which says that every vertex makes a path of length zero. Then uh, you look at the second rule, which says that every arc makes a path of length one. And then you notice there's a path from one to four, from vertex one to vertex four, either through two or through three. And now we are done because we reach a least fixed point. But what we want to analyze is not a graph. We want to analyze a program. So we need a way to encode that in data log. And that's actually very simple. We do just a direct transliteration. Now, in general, in data log, uh, you have a distinction between intentional and extensional relations. Intentional relations are like the arc relations in the previous example, something that is given as an input. And extensional relations are something like the path relation in the example, something that is computed. In our case, we have two kinds of intentional relations. One kind you already saw is the kind that encodes the program that we want to analyze. The other one is uh, the ones that are used to set the knobs of the analysis. Because you have these knobs and you can use either more precise or less precise uh, analysis, we say that the analysis is parametric. And finally, the extensional relations, roughly you can think of them as keeping track of the Sim symbolic state that is being computed by this analysis. So we think of, the intuition is that we think of this analysis as being some sort of interpreter that 
either keep some abstract state or some more concrete state. And uh, let's see a, how a small part of this implement of the implementation of this interpreter looks like. The, how do you implement the operational semantics of this smudge to command? So we have a pair of rules. And first of all, we make sure that for each we will make sure that for each location L, uh, exactly one of cheap of L and precise of L holds. That's how we will set uh, the input. Because of that, we are guaranteed that for one location, at most one of these two rule instances will fire. Both of these rules conclude that uh, object beta is dirty at some location, and they have some common assumptions. They both require that object alpha is known to be dirty, and there's a smudge from alpha to beta. But in the precise variant, you also want to check that the values uh, of the objects have a sum that is even. Now, notice that this analysis is monotonic in the sense of that equation. So, for example, if you look at the previous example that I had, you'll see that this rule instance is fired. The first one, if you set cheap of zero, the second one, if you just set precise of zero. So, we uh, increased the relation precise of zero. Nothing happened in this particular place in the relation dirty. But if you look at chip of one, if you change it in chip of, in precise of one, now the extra conditions don't hold, so now the relation dirty uh, shrinks a little bit in that part. Okay, one way to visualize what's happening in this example is the following. Um, each column represents an object in the program. The four blue dots at the top represent the state of the objects uh, when the program starts. The four blue dots that are below them represent the state of the objects after the first, the command at label zero, and so on. The vertical dashed lines represent that in this language you cannot clean objects. Once they are dirty, they remain dirty. And the other lines that are kind of oblique represent the smudge command. So for example, at program point zero, there's a command smudge two of x, y. Now, we saw earlier that this particular command, if you keep track of the values, you'll notice that it still propagates there. But if you're in this uh, first iteration where you ignore the values, you know, don't know that, you'd expect the dirt to propagate in roughly half of cases. And that's what, that is, what is on the right-hand side. Uh, if you, the assertion that we had, actually, is that we want to see, uh, we want there to not be a path from the top left to the bottom right. And to figure out if there is a path or not from top left to the bottom right, we need to analyze precisely at least some of these smudge commands. But which of them? And now we can take two points of view. We can be optimistic and say, let's look at these ones, because we, if we are lucky, and both of them don't propagate dirt, then we disconnected the top left from the bottom right. So that's the optimistic approach. Or we can be pessimistic and say, let's look at these ones, because we hope that if we look at the values, we'll figure out that they do propagate dirt, and now we know that the assertion fails. Or we can try to take into account probabilities. So the first one is what we did before, and the second two us are described in this paper. How can we take into account probabilities? Well, remember that for each of these smudge commands, if we don't do a lot of work to keep track of the values, the best guess that we have is that um, uh, for smudge k, uh, it propagates dirt in one out of k situations. So we have some uncertainty there, which we model by a random variable. So we introduce a random variable for that. It looks like this. So the correspondence that you saw earlier between what happens when you have chip of zero and precise of zero, we encode that as the event S zero equals one. Zero is the location we're referring, that, we're referring to, the argument of chip and precise. Uh, and uh, what happens in the other place, we interpret as this event, S one equals zero. 
where uh, the instance in the chip analysis disappears and it's not replaced by anything comparable in the precise one. Now, how do we find the expectations of these variables? Well, first of all, what values should they have? Well, I, because on, at position zero we have uh, smudge two, we'd like to find an expectation of one over two. And because at position, at location one, we have a smudge three, we'd like a probability of one over three. But how do we infer these things? Uh, in, how, do we, how do we find them empirically without thinking about it? Because we, we want to program a computer to do it. Well, for our example, it's simple, actually. We can say, uh, let's look at many programs, at many occurrences of the smudge two command and just uh, count in how many cases it happens that it does propagate dirt. And then you get an estimate. The problem with this approach is that it does not generalize very well. So I remember that we had the requirement that the analysis is implemented in data log, which allows us to say for instances in the chip analysis, we, uh, uh, for each instance in the chip analysis, we give it a random variable. but we, to stay general, we don't have many more other requirements. In particular, we don't have this requirement that rules come in pairs. And in general, there's no easy way to say, oh, if this instance disappeared, uh, do I have a way to see if it was replaced by something similar or not? It might be replaced by something that does something equivalent, but it's very complicated. So uh, in other words, you just cannot observe these simple events, like S0 equals 1. Uh, so in machine learning parlance, we say that these random variables are hidden. But you can still do inference even when you have hidden variables. And what we do is we, we do maximum likelihood estimation with hidden variables using variational inference uh, and the optimization technique that we found to work well is cyclic coordinate descent. Uh, but if you want to see the details of this, you'll have to look at the paper. So now let's step back and look at the big picture again. Remember we have two sets of knobs. There's the knobs on the analysis. Those change in each iteration cycle of the refinement. Uh, we also have um, a set of knobs on the refinement. Those are, how do we set those? Well, we do that only once in an offline phase. What do we do in this offline phase? We run the analysis many times with many settings of the knobs. We observe what happens. From those observations, we'll build a big formula that gives us the likelihood of that event. We optimize that, and we get back these parameters, the expectations of the variables. And the end results uh, look something like this. On the right-hand side, you have the rules in your data log program that implements the analysis. On the left, you have these values that we infer. When you get a one, that means that that particular rule uh, doesn't forget any information, doesn't do any approximation of what happens in the program, uh, as long as we can tell from what we observed in the training data. You have smaller numbers, that means you observe situations where information is lost. So we can use this to quantify the loss of information. So what did I learn from this? Well, I learned that machine learning is a branch of optimization, uh, so, and that program verification has many options optimization problems. Uh, when somebody says optimization, you usually think of uh, optimizing some uh, formula that is given some, uh, uh, some analytic formula, but you don't have to optimize that. You can optimize any algorithm in principle. Now, if you want to get uh, an, optimization algorithm, an optimization that actually works, you need to restrict your attention to some family of algorithms, and that could be uh, things that we can express with an analytic formula. It could be slowly varying functions, it could be deep neural networks, or it could be data log programs. And here we focus on data log programs and try to find what works well on that. And the optimization problems that we defined as one is to find what are the best numbers to put um, on rules that explain out our observations, and how to find the next best abstractions. Both of them are formulated as optimization problems. Okay. Now, what we found out is that for the first problem, there's an algorithm that works very well. 
And for the second one, we found out that off-the-shelf MACSAT solvers work well if you use a simple probabilistic model, but not so well if you use a uh, fancier one. So we might need to try something like what we saw yesterday, this pilot thing uh, might work well. Uh, if you want to find out more, uh, you can look on the archive where you see the proofs as well. And now, you know we are at the end. You mentioned that you were optimizing an analysis uh, described as a data log program by uh, turning on and off certain uh, um, expensive uh, subparts of the analysis. So there are many people here, including myself, who implemented the analysis where we would have heuristics to decide whether or not we would be doing something expensive. But, uh, heuristics like uh, you apply partitioning but only if you detect that the program contains certain constructs that indicate that you need to partition. And we, if I was tempted to use machine learning for this application, of course it, um, my analysis is not in data log. What are the things that are specific to data log in what you do and what are the things that you know, are not important? What are the requirements on the analysis? Well, the requirements, uh, one of the important ones, I guess, for this refinement algorithm, not for the previous ones, is that the analysis is monotonic. So if you increase precision locally in a place, uh, you can only get a better global result, which is not always the case. Uh, I think that's the main requirement that you have, uh, apart from data log. Uh, another one, a more practical one, is that uh, there exists some analysis, so we did not implement this analysis. We took them from uh, the implementation of other people. Uh, and the reason for that is that I think it's not quite so easy how to figure out to implement the analysis in data log in the first place such that is uh, efficient uh, in practice. So it's, it takes, a, because the language is so restricted, it takes a little bit of effort to figure out how to do it properly. So just the restriction to data log is a bit, um, I have one, one small question about uh, the, what is actually learned by the learning algorithm. So the learning algorithm probably learns a bunch of weights. Are they corresponding to formulas, to instantiations of the formulas, to something else? So there is, yeah, so this is, these are instantiations of the formula. So are you, are you learning something across programs or only within one program? The, so we have, for each instantiation of the rule, there's a random variable. But to prevent overfitting, there is uh, a constraint that says all the random variables that correspond to instances of the same rule have the same expectation. Okay? So you do the cheapest analysis. You look at all the instances that you see there. You know each instance from each from which rule it comes, mm -hmm. and for each rule you had an associated number like this. So, so what, what do you save as you finish training? What do you save to the disk? Do you save, like for every data lock rule, do you save one, do you save one double number? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs>